Welcome everyone to week seven. This week is a lot better than last week. It's one of the more fun weeks of the semester. Um, we've got some cancer, some pharmacology, some muscle anatomy. Uh, it starts to feel more like real medicine now. And then especially with micro coming up, you'll start to get more into it. It's also, I think it's your last biochem lectures, which may or may not be nice, depending on what you're into. So what I might do is I will present and we might get started. So we're going to start off with introduction to cancer. So just firstly, some definitions that you might hear thrown around and assume that you know, but you might not know. Um, malignant tumors originating from epithelial tissues are called carcinomas. And it's important to know that cancers are kind of subclassified according to the tissue they arise from. And in some cases, they'll resemble these tissues. In other cases, they might not, depending on how cancerous it is. So for example, squamous cell carcinomas resemble stratified squamous tissue. Adenocarcinomas resemble glands. That's the adeno refers to the glands. So just some naming conventions. So what causes cancer? So cancer is caused or acquired through damage to DNA. And this can either be inherited through germline transmission or it can be acquired from environmental exposure. And it isn't just, it's usually not just one or two genetic mutations. It's usually, they say at least four to six. And it's the accumulation of genetic errors that promote the growth and longevity of cancer cells while attenuating repair mechanisms. So for example, mutations may allow the cell to evade apoptosis, lengthen telomeres and accelerate through the cell cycle by pass, bypassing checkpoints which diminish the effectiveness of genetic repair mechanisms. So in other words, does, does that mean? Essentially it means pass through the cell cycle quickly, means it's gonna proliferate a lot, evade optosis and lengthen telomeres, means it's gonna be immortal. And the quicker it goes through the checkpoints of the cell cycle, the less ability there are for genetic repair mechanisms. And um, cancers also can secrete hormones that stimulate growth, which means they're self-sustaining or autocrine um, secretions and that means the body can't really regulate them. And finally, they evade recognition and deactivation by the immune system through um, particular protein expressions. So this is just a list of the sorts of things that cause cancer. They can either be inherited through germline defects, and these make up about 10% of cancers. They might not just give someone cancer, they might just make them more susceptible to cancer. So if you need four to six mutations, it might give them like a few more, like a few more to start with. Or if it's a recessive gene that requires both alleles to be mutated for the cancer to be acquired, it could lead to the mutation of one allele. So you're going to have, if the other allele is mutated, then you're going to get cancer. So you're much more susceptible. There's also a variety of acquired um, environmental cancers. Um, these lead to defects in somatic cells rather than germ cells. And a sufficient mutation may lead it to become cancerous. Um, infectious agents such as EBV, which is Epstein-Barr virus, cause, cause glandular fever, that can cause Burkitt's lymphoma. Human papillomavirus can cause a lot of cervical cancers. Smoking, as you will start to, you are smoking in your histories, that's because it's associated a lot with cancer, 90% of lung cancers. Alcohol, processed meat is a type three carcinogen, which is on exams a lot. And it's also important to know that risk of cancer increases with age. Okay. So now some more kind of concepts about how cancers, normal cells become cancerous. So in a normal cell, you have things called proto-oncogenes, which are genes that code for proteins that support growth, division, and cell adhesion. Essentially, it supports proliferation and progression through the cell cycle. What can happen is this can be hyperactivated or excessively stimulated. And if a proto-oncogene mutates to become excessively stimulating, it becomes an oncogene. So oncogenes are a gain of function mutation and they are dominant. A way you can think about that is cells that progressively proliferate or go through the cell cycle really quickly tend to have like a survival advantage compared to the other cells that they're around. So they're more likely to survive and reproduce more. So it's going to be a mutation that will assist it more. So it's a dominant mutation and may promote or predispose to the development of cancer and stimulate premature mitosis and inappropriately accelerate cell growth. The opposite of oncogenes, which support progression through the cell cycle, rapid proliferation, really quickly dividing, are tumor suppressor genes. 
these suppress the activation of oncogenes and or restrain cell division. So genetically, they're recessive. So generally, you'll find that loss of function genes are recessive. They require both alleles to be mutated in order for it to um, the mutation to occur and have an effect, whereas gain of function mutations like the oncogene generally only need one allele to be mutated. And these um, tumor suppressor genes, I'll talk about them more a bit later, but they transcribe regulatory proteins and checkpoints in the cell cycle that make sure the cells aren't immortal and they don't divide if there's damage. So here's an image. So you can see on your left, you have your oncogene, which can lead to a hyperactive protein, um, a protein really overproduced because you have a lot of gene amplification. And it, just because it's not repairing and it's going through the cell cycle so much, there can be mutations that lead to rearrangement. And you can see these here can lead to overproduction and hyperactivity. Um, tumor suppressor genes, they can either code for the adhesion and recognition proteins. In cancer, these may uh, be defected. So the cells don't need to be around other cells. They can just grow by themselves, which is dangerous. And they also involve coding for enzymes involved in DNA repair. If these are mutated or not as effective, you're going to have more likely to have mutations and this mutations bring on more mutations because you're not repairing them. And um, some tumor suppressors um, inhibit cell division by stopping the cell cycle. This is just to understand the kind of germline transmission and why that makes people more susceptible. Usually people have two alleles for a tumor suppressor gene. If one of the alleles mutate, they might have a bit of a reduced function, but generally the person will be okay. If both alleles mutate, then you're going to have a loss of heterozygosity and it can make you get cancer. And this process can take months to years. Whereas if you have inherited, for example, a retinoblastoma mutation, we'll talk about that a bit later, you have much less time, less opportunity to get the second allele mutated and you're more susceptible to cancer. Um, cancer cell characteristics. So what is a cancer cell actually? So the development of a healthy cell into a cancerous cell is called transformation. Cancer cells, if they isolate cancer cells and put them in a petri dish and see why are they different to other cells, firstly, they lack contact inhibition. So usually in a normal cell, when it reaches the end of the petri dish plate, it stops growing. Cancer cells don't do that. They just continue to go through the cell cycle and they don't have those regulatory hormones or indications. Um, cancer cells have a reduced requirement for growth factors, which means that they don't rely on the body telling them to grow or not to grow in a sort of homeostasis mechanism. Rather, they're autocrine and they produce their own growth factors, which act on themselves. And so they can, um, yeah, and so they can, and the converse thing of this is that they're resistant to growth inhibitory signals. So they can't be told to stop and they also make their own growth factors. Um, mutations can lead to the elongation of telomeres, which makes cells immortal. Um, cancer cells are invasive. You can see here they're starting to grow in clumps. They can lead to angiogenesis, which is the development of blood vessels, so they can be self-sustaining and bring nutrients to themselves and get rid of their waste, and they can escape immune surveillance. This is a carrier type of cancer cells. You can see how a variety of mutations have led to excess overproduction acceleration through the cell cycle and you can see it looks like a mess this is from breast cancer and you might get a carrier type like this on the exam and you have to say this looks like cancer this is just something that they mention a lot and i never really understood so i thought i'd explain it um what is actually a tumor suppressor gene so they'll tell you tumor suppressors are p53 and rb and then kind of leave it there this is just an understand big picture so you have context if there's damage to a DNA, that will activate the P53 protein, which will upregulate, you don't need to remember these names, P21, which inactivates CDK2 and cyclin E. So it blocks cell division. So if there's DNA damage, P53 blocks cell division. However, what can happen is if you have a mutation to the tumor suppressor genes like the P53, you cannot block this complex. And so the CDK2 and C cyclin E are active. They lead to the phosphorylation of RB and cell division occurs normally. So you can't actually stop cell division if this P53 isn't working. A more common mutation is retinoblastoma. And what can happen is you can have a mutation so that it is permanently phosphorylated. And the phosphorylation is what leads to ETF, 
which leads to the cell division, normal cell division. Don't get confused by the words. All you need to understand is that if there is a mutation in RB, there is no way to block cell division. The cell just has to keep cycling. So now that's a bit more than you need to know, but at least now you know why this is working. So you can tr you don't have to trust me. Now you actually know. Um, stages. So these are generally the mutations to the development of cancer. Usually there's a single mutation in a cell, then that will kind of through clonal selection, that cell will have an advantage in growing really quickly. So you'll have a growth of a tumor, which is a lump or growth that can either be malignant or benign. And eventually that will lead to metastasis which is kind of the invasion of that cancer to other parts of the body. Important, very, it's on exams a lot, it usually requires at least four to six mutations. You can see here you have normal cells, a mutation occurs, the mutations descendants um, proliferate much more quickly. And then because you're not having that regulatory mechanism and you have an over rapid growth through the cell cycle, you're leading to even more mutations. So the cancer becomes even worse. Um, morphology, what do cancer cells look like? They often have enlarged nucleus with little cytoplasm because of all of that like new genetic material being made. You saw the karyotype before. The nucleus may be irregular and stains darker than the nucleus in normal cells. I'll show you a picture of this in a bit. It has a loss of specialized features. So usually you can, if you can remember from your stem cells, they differentiate into specialized cells. In cancer, all the mutations lead to kind of something called anaplasia, which is the lack of differentiation. Sometimes if it's really bad, you can't even tell which origin tissue it's from. It can lead to pleomorphism, which is an abnormal and inconsistent size and shape of the cell. A loss of polarity, very high yield, is that cells should not breach the basement membrane. If they do breach the basement membrane, it essentially means it's cancer. And it's a proteolysis of the fibers. I'll actually explain this in a bit, but it's a proteolysis of the fibers in the membrane that lead to this. Um, they grow abnormally. They have lack of inhibition by adjacent cells. So they don't have contact inhibition. And the growth is often disorganized, irregular, and chaotic. There also is evidence of mitosis because of the high rate of proliferation. But it's important when you look at a tissue or a specimen that it's not just a highly labeled tissue, which means it's not a tissue that just rapidly regenerates itself. Before we look at the different types, it's important to define benign and malignant sorts of cancers. So benign generally remains localized at its site of origin. It resembles the cell it came from, so it doesn't have anaplasia. You can still see the differentiation. And it's usually not fatal unless it's in a vulnerable confined space, such as the brain, and then the intracranial pressure can lead to problems. And what is malignant? Malignant is when the, the cell does not resemble the tissue or cell of origin and has anaplasia. It's invasive, so it's invading surrounding tissue and or distant sites, which is metastasis. And there's a table here if, um, that also explains it. So it's based on the differentiation, the rate of growth the invasion and metastasis. Benign does not have metastasis. Malignant does have metastasis. Malignant grows rapidly. Benign grows usually a bit more progressive. So this is a um, this is from one of the workshops we did. I hope I'm allowed to do this, but I think I am. This is the progression from a normal cell then a, into a malignant cell. And you can see slowly the um, ratio between the nucleus and the cytoplasm is increased. These have very large nuclei. They're staining very darkly. It's more erratic, less conformed, less specialized structures. It begins to look more like a clump and more like a mess. So what you can do for revision, if you want, is you can look through this list and then you can compare it here. Fortunately, you can't see a basement membrane. I reckon if, if I were to give an exam question, I do it invading the basement membrane, but yeah. What is metastasis? Metastasis is a spread of tumor to a site discontinuous with the primary tumor. It can be local or distant. It can either spread through natural body cavities, through the lymphatics, or through the blood. And portal, cavell drainage, you don't really need to understand what those mean. It can just go through the vein and blood supply. Um, it usually results from an inactivation of checkpoints and repair mechanisms. I showed you the P53 and RB mechanisms before. And as I was saying before, they secrete proteolytic enzymes that break through the basal lamina and capillary beds, which is what allows it to break through the basement membrane and disseminate into the blood. And the um, act of the cancer going into the vascular system is called introversation. You can see it happening in here, introversation. It's spreading. And as you can see, as it spreads, sometimes what it's gonna do is, the cancer is quite big, it can go to a smaller blood vessel, it's going to start to adhere to capillary walls. Then it's going to undergo extraversation, which is the opposite of introversation. 
it'll go into the tissue and proliferate even more to form metastasis. In the secondary colonization, often cancer cells will secrete something called VEGF, which is a signaling hormone, and it signals endothelial cells to grow an outbranch, which essentially means to grow a blood vessel so that it can facilitate nutrient supply and waste removal, and the cancer can be self-sufficient. That process is called angiogenesis and often occurs secondary to colonization metastasis. It secretes VGEF, secreting VGF here, that's selling the endothelial cells to grow an outbranch and it facilitates nutrient supply and removal. Um, finally, viruses can also cause cancer. So viruses account for about 15% of cancers and there's also often environmental impl um, exposures implicated as well. So a few people might've had glandular fever before, that's associated to Burkitt's lymphoma, but not all people who have had glandular, fe fe um, glandular fever or an EBV infection get Burkitt's lymphoma. So there's environmental exposures that are also implicated that aren't very well understood. Um, hepatitis B and C cause liver cancer, HPV, cervical cancer, EBV lymphomas. Yeah. Um, so I'll be taking this section. This section's fairly brief, so yeah, let's get started. David, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I'll answer Daniel's question afterwards just because I've changed the slides. Actually, can we do it now? Why are cancer? Did someone answer why is cancer actually bad? Why is cancer actually bad? Yeah. So... Daniel, the reason why cancer is actually bad is like, it's a good question. What's essentially happening is because the cells are proliferating so much, they have a really high metabolic demand. So often they're going to take a lot of nutrients from other cell types that need it. And that can, that's also why a lot of people who have cancer have a lot of weight loss. So it's going to damage your other tissue. And often it can invade into other tissues that um, invade into other tissues that can um, block their function. It can block ducts, blood vessels, cause necrosis. It can block um, your intestines, which can cause um, a buildup. And it's, um, yeah, sorry, it can block ducts, vessels, passages, block blood supply, block waste excretion. It steals nutrients from other, um, other parts of the body. Yeah, essentially, that's it. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. Andrew, do you think that was all right with an explanation? Yeah, yeah. Basically, you get weight loss and then um, takes a bunch of the nutrients, and it can grow into places it's not supposed to. It can block stuff, which is a pretty major thing. Um, yeah, but I think you basically got most of it. I think, and that's basically what the slide is, based honestly. So, like some local effects. So, <clears throat> at a specific site of the cancer. Um, it will grow and expand so it can displace your normal adjacent tissue and that can block some vital passages. So um, it might block some vessels um, like your arteries or veins and it can also block organs. So for example, if you had perhaps colon cancer, um, something in your intestines that could block your intestines and perhaps you have fecal obstruction. So basically your period isn't like moving along and stuff like that or perhaps it might block some glands and you can't secrete whatever hormones or, um, you know, like mucus or something. Um, holistically, overall on the patient, it's very metabolically demanding, as you can imagine, because you're replicating a lot. So that will compete with your normal cells for nutrition and blood supply. Um, and this can actually lead to rapid weight loss because they're using up so much energy. It can actually cause um, your other organs or muscles to break down their proteins in order to supply the cancer. Um, just because this cancer is so metabolically demanding. Something to know is that just even if you get a cancer removed, they can be dormant uh, and they can reappear, reappear even decades later after it has been removed. And it's just, that's just because perhaps um, when you originally removed it, you didn't remove all of it. And then that, decades later, something's changed and that cancer's somehow gotten blood supply again. And um, with its increased blood supply, it's managed to start growing again. Next slide, please. So inherited cancers. So this is just about 10% of cancers are from inherited genetics. 
um, is the cause basically. So feature suggestive of inherited cancer. It's basically if you have family members um, with the same sort of cancer or early onset. So if you have several close or first degree relatives with a common cancer or related cancer, such as breast or ovarian cancer, um, that might suggest that your family might have some mutations that predispose you or cause this type of cancer. <clears throat> You have two members of the same family with the same rare cancer. Statistically, that's unlikely. So perhaps you have a mutation for that sort of rare cancer. And if you have an early age of onset of cancer. Um, that suggests that perhaps you were born with a mutation that predisposed you to this cancer. Because if you weren't born with this mutation, then mutations um, sort of accumulate as you get older and older. But if you are at an early age, you shouldn't have had many mutations or enough mutations to get cancer. So if you do get at an early age, that suggests that perhaps uh, the patient inherited some uh, mutated genes. And if you have bilateral cancer in paired organs, so something like the kidneys or perhaps tumors in two different organs in the same individual, um, that's also suggestive cancer because you're unlikely to have um, basically random mutations in two different places that both led to cancer. That's just statistically a lot more unlikely. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so specifically looking at breast cancer, two genes genetically predisposed, predisposed patients. So that's BRCA1 on 17Q. So uh, that's a small arm of seven, chromosome 17 and BRCA2 on 13Q, which is the small arm of chromosome 13. The specific location isn't too important, but features that indicate increased likelihood of an individual with BRCA mutations is basically what we said before. So if you have multiple cases of early onset breast cancer, ovarian cancer, which is related can uh, related cancer, in addition to a family history, or perhaps breast and ovarian cancer in the same woman, bilateral breast cancer, and male breast cancer, which is rarer. So if you do get male breast cancer, you might have that BRCA mutation. <clears throat> and finally, you have Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, um, which is just, yeah, that ethnicity is just, um, has a lot more higher risk in general for many diseases um, just because of the lineage. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, so some tumor suppressor genes. So David mentioned these before. You have your retinoblastoma gene and your p53 gene so retinoblastoma itself was actually a rare childhood tumor of the retina about one in twenty thousand people and then they discovered that this gene uh, was sort of responsible for it so hence it was called the retinoblastoma gene so it can either be hereditary you can either inherit this cancer uh, or the mutation rather or it can be sporadic, but essentially uh, tumor suppressor genes, you must lose both copies uh, for cancer to begin. So you must lose both copies of retinoblastoma gene to get retinoblastoma. If you do get it hereditarily, um, it'll be a very young age onset and you will have tumor in both of your eyes because um, if you think about it, right, the mutations are inherited in your germ cells. And so that means all of your cells will have um, these mutations and so you'll get the tumor in both of your eyes if it's non-hereditary so it's just a ran random mutation then it'll likely just be that mutation will likely just be in one eye and it will develop at a later stage as you accumulate mutations throughout life the p53 gene what it does is that it arrests the cell cycle in mitosis if it sees as dna damage and it tries to repair it if the damage is too great it will initiate apoptosis which is basically the cell committing suicide um, in defective p53, these cancer cells um, then can escape apoptosis and the DNA won't be repaired and so the tumor can continue to replicate. And so in about 50% of all tumors, you will have actually mutations and loss of function of p53. Um, and so now some specific examples they get you to look at in your lectures uh, and perhaps some of your workshops. So first thing is um, chronic myeloid leukemia, which is known as CML. So first of all, for some context, uh, we need to look at tyrosine kinase receptors. So what these receptors are is that they're transmembrane receptors and they transduce extracellular growth factors. So what that means is they basically sit in the membrane and growth factors, ex extracellular growth factors from outside the cell bind to them 
and they signal to the cell after the spinning that's, oh, we need to grow, basically. Um, if the genes are mutated, then these receptors can become overactive and they will continually tell the cell to divide and then it becomes an oncogene. So in CML, you have this reciprocal translocation mutation, which basically means that um, two chromosomes exchange parts with each other. Um, and this reciprocal translocation mutation occurs for the gene of able tyranny kinase, which is a type of tyranny kinase from the long arm of chromosome 9 to the long arm of chromosome 22, where the BCR gene is located. You don't need to know too much about the BCR gene, but basically the fusion between the BCR gene and the able tyrosine kinase gene leads to an overactive able tyrosine kinase, and that can cause your uncontrolled cell division. So as you can see on the diagram, you have your chromosome 9, you have your chromosome 22. They basically swap little bits of their long arm, and as a result, you get this mutant able tyrosine kinase, and you get cancer as a result of overactivity from the tyrosine kinase, telling it to continually divide. Next slide, please. <coughs> so briefly use treatment. So compared inhibitors, tyrosine kinases, for them to function, they require binding to ATP. So if you can use competitive inhibitors to prevent ATP from binding, then you will prevent the function of tyrosine kinase. Another one is antibodies specifically made against receptor types, uh, tyrosine kinases or their ligands. So this will just be like made in labs and these antibodies will specifically target the receptors or the ligands that it binds to to prevent binding between the two and it'll prevent them from switching on. So kind of similar to competitive inhibitors and angiogenics. So as we mentioned, angiogenesis is quite important for cancers to receive the nutrition to grow. So um, if, you if you use anti-angiogenics, you target VGF, which we mentioned before, this can help prevent the cancers from growing. So um, one drug they get you to look at is Gleevec or Glivec or Imatinib. So there's quite a few names. Um, I believe Imatinib is the uh, drug name itself, whereas like Gleevec is like the um, commercial name. <coughs> Excuse me. So Gleevec is an ATP competitive inhibitor, which we just mentioned, and it's specific against the mutant able tyrosine kinase. So it won't block normal able it won't block normal able tyrosine kinase. It will only block these mutant types. And so it has a quite a high success rate. 98% of patients show a complete hematological response. That means the normal white blood cell count, uh, it returned to normal. So um, CML is a leukemia. So if you have leukemia, your white blood cell count goes, you know, skyrockets But um, with this drug. So they were able to return to a normal white blood cell count for 98% of the patients. Overall survival rate was 89%. So it's quite a good cure. Common side effects include vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pain, headache, and rash, which are quite common uh, side effects for quite a few medications in general. So it's not too bad. Yep, just moving on. Um, next, looking at colon cancer, which is also something they mentioned. A polyp is essentially an abnormal growth of cells on the colon. So if you look at the left-hand picture, all of those little round things are your polyps. And on the right side, you can see a normal looking intestines. So you can see that, um, yeah, there's quite a few polyps on that one. It's quite abnormal looking. Um, polyps aren't always malignant, but um, sometimes they can. And in this case, with familial adenomatous polyposis, it is malignant. So it's an inherited condition um, where there's polyposis and it's caused by a mutation in the APC gene, which is a tumor suppressor gene. You don't have to know too much about this gene, but just if you can remember APC, that's nice. But if you can't, that's okay as well. Almost 100% penetrance. So penetrance refers to if you get the gene, if you get the mutated gene, how often do you get the cancer? So if you have almost 100% penetrance, that means if you inherit this gene, you will basically always develop the disease. So these polyps initially are benign, but eventually they become malignant and they have to be removed. So through surgery, you might have to regularly get polyps removed or you might remove your large intestines completely. Um, and yeah, next slide. <coughs> 
and yeah, that's the end. So not too long, which is nice. And yeah, we'll move on to pharmacology. It's me again, my last one for today. So introduction to pharmacology. We'll talk about Andrew's tyrosine kinases in a bit. So what is a drug? Drugs are administered to produce a desirable psychological or physiological effect on the body. They can either be derived from natural products like plants or animal extracts or made using chemicals synthetically by humans. Nomenclature, when you encounter drugs, Andrew before mentioned Gleevec had a chemical name and a propriety name. So the chemical name is a scientific name based on the compound structure. The trade name, propriety name is a name given by the pharmaceutical company. A generic name is a drug's active ingredient, which is responsible for its primary effect. This is not influenced by advertising, just the primary chemical. Chemical name not influenced by advertising, just the chemical name, usually really wrong. Long trade name propriety is influenced by advertising. You can have lots of different trade names or different companies making the same drug. So, yeah. Important to keep that in mind. What is a receptor? Receptors are responsible for signal transduction and communication between cells. They may interact with drugs to induce a signal and initiate a physiological response. So you'll hear the terms that drugs can be specific or selective. A specific drug is a drug that produces action at a specific site where its target receptor exists, and this is usually localized, which means it should prevent systemic effects. Selectivity is a kind of cross-reactivity in which drugs have an infinite to a variety of different receptors throughout the body and induce various physio physiological responses accordingly. So I hope that makes sense. Specific, one spot localized, not lots of systematic effects. Selective, you could have receptors for it in your gut, by your lungs. And if you give the drug, it can influence all those different systems and have lots of systemic effects due to the affinity of the drug to those receptors. Um, is there a question? Yeah, Andrew's got that. Um, receptor relationship between receptor and drugs. So kind of the receptor you have determines the concentration of drug necessary for a desired effect. And that is determined by the receptor's affinity for the drug or the drug's affinity for the receptor. Um, the selectivity of drugs are determined by receptors. So drugs can have various affinities for different classes of receptors influencing therapeutic and toxic effects. So whether a drug is an agonist or antagonist is determined by the receptor. An agonist is a drug that initiates a protein conformational change, initiating a cell signal transduction cascade and promotes a physiological response or enhanced physiological action. An antagonist hinders the transmission of a signal and or preventing the stimulation and subsequent protein conformation change. In other words, ag agonists stimulate a response, antagonists prevent a response. Mechanism for transmembrane signaling. Um, I'm just going to use this image to talk you through it. You have hydrophobic ligands, which means they're lipophilic, which means they like lipids. They can cross the plasma membrane and act on an intracellular receptor, also known as a nuclear receptor. Often hormones act like this. Um, this one is a receptor whose intracellular um, enzymatic activity is regulated by the ligand binding and changing its conformation. This one is a transmembrane receptor which stimulates protein kinase when activated. That's just an enzyme. Um, the ones you're going to want to start to know, ligand-gated receptors open or close depending on the binding of a ligand. And these are called ionotropic. So you can have acetylcholine, don't have to know what that is, binding there, and that's going to let sodium rush through. You can also have receptor proteins that stimulate a G protein and activates a cascade of intracellular messengers. So you can have um, something's going to bind here, it's going to lead to a reaction over here, which is going to lead to lots of little reactions that eventually cause a product. These are secondary messengers. Cyclic AMP is a sec um, secondary messenger and it can be involved in calcium release. Different types of receptors take different amounts of times to activate and to produce a response. If you're using a nuclear receptor, it's going to take a lot of time because it needs transcription. Inotropic, where the ligand just binds and opens the gate, very quick. Uh, molecular targets, what is the title of this? One second. Molecular targets for drug actions, type of receptors. Like we were saying, intracellular receptors include hydrophobic ligands, which involve lots of hormones, are, lipophobic, are hydrophobic. Uh, 
and these include like thyroid and steroid hormones. And these often go to receptors, which stimulate the transcription of genes. This takes a lot of time for a clinical effect. And there may be lots of lingering effect as enzyme synthesized may be active while no agonist is present. Um, if we look at the tyrosine kinase that um, Andrew was talking about before, these are ligand regulated transmembrane. Transmembrane means it goes across the membrane. A ligand will bind to the extracellular domain. It'll lead to a conformation change that leads to the dimerization of the two receptor polypeptides. And this activates an enzyme, which um, leads to the phosphorylation of the receptor and leads to downstream signal transduction. So in the um, mutation Andrew was talking about, it was permanently phosphorylated. So it kept giving a signal induction. That's called an oncogene because it's promoting through the cell cycle. Um, examples of these are insulin and epidermal growth factor. You don't need to know um, tyrosine kinase too much. You should know intracellular receptors a bit. You definitely need to know ion channels and G protein second messengers. So ion channels are ligand gated ion channels. Ligands bind to the protein, change the conformation, and increase the conduction of certain ions or molecules into or out of the cell. Conversely, the binding of ligands may block the movement of ions and or molecules through the transmembrane receptor. So that's kind of your agonist antagonist definition. An agonist will lead to the conformation change and allow ions and molecules to flow through. An antagonist will blo block the ligand binding and will inhibit the movement of molecules through. G protein and second messengers, a ligand will interact with the surface receptor on the extracellular side. So activate a G protein on the cytoplasmic side and the G protein often modifies an effector element which increases the concentration of a secondary messenger. And um, I have notes about what the secondary messenger does. Maybe I'll read them. That's all. Um, Secondary messenger stimulates mobilization of carbohydrates and tags. It influences calcium ions, rate of cardiac um, contraction and strength. It's very important for calcium. Um, important to understand just that all you really need to know with this, ligand interacts with surface receptor. Lots of little reactions happen to create a bigger response. This is metatropic, often takes a bit more time than ionotropic, which is quite immediate. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, enzymes. So I'm um, just a concept to understand with some drugs. Some drugs are put in the body in an inactive state or are produced by the body. Some hormones are synthesized by the body in an inactive state and they need certain enzymes to act on them to make them active. So an example is pro-insulin, which has this bit that needs to be cleaved in order for the insulin to be functional. Um, this is probably the most important slide of this presentation. There's three sort of phases to the administration of drugs, and you'll be going through each of these in lectures. The pharmaceutical phase describes how a drug is released from a package. Is it enterically coded to survive the stomach? That depends on where you want it to act. So that's how the drug, what is the structure of the drug and how it's administered. The pharmacokinetic phase refers to what the body does to the drug. So um, how the body kind of inactivates the drug, how the body acts on the drug. So the body will absorb the drug, the body will distribute the drug, drug <laughs> the body will metabolize the drug, which means it can inactivate it and make it soluble for excretion. Some properties that affect pharmacokinetics, which is how the body acts on the drug, is the shape and size of the molecules in the drug, the ionization of the drugs, and the lipid solubility of the drugs. So it'll be explained in future lectures. I mean, if you can ask questions about them now if you want as well. You know, like if something is ionized, it's going to have trouble crossing the cell membrane. So it's not going to go to a site. A drug won't diffuse into a tissue when it's ionized. Lipid soluble will diffuse readily. Very big is going to have trouble diffusing. Very small will diffuse quickly. Pharmacodynamic phase is what the drug does to the body. So there's a few um, steps to this. The drug will bind to a receptor that will transduce a signal transduction pathway that will lead to a physiological response. What does affinity mean? Affinity is kind of the connection between a drug and a receptor. It's influenced by molecular size, shape, and electrical charge. It's determined by an equilibrium disassociation constant. Um, again, in subsequent lectures, we'll go through that. You can ask if you have questions, but I think it's, it's in chemistry, so you might remember it's associated with like, yeah, you might remember it from chemistry. Um, affinity should not be confused with efficacy. Affinity refers to the strength of binding between a drug and a receptor. Efficacy is the ability of a drug receptor complex to induce an effect.
Um, these, they put this in the lecture, it's really more useful later. These are how the suffix of the drugs can help you realize what class it is. Uh, not super important for you right now. Okay, um, so this week we're going through muscle tissues, um, continuing on from epithelium, which had a few weeks ago and also connective tissue. Um, yeah, so I reckon muscles is really the, one of the funnest topics, so let's get straight into it. Um, so with uh, muscle cells, uh, there's a lot of similarities to normal cells, but they like to use slightly different terminology. So first, the myofibrils. So these are microfilaments. So as you can see on this diagram um, in the right there, so our myofibrils, these are actin and myosin microfilaments. And so know how you have a cytoplasm. Well, in a muscle cell, this is just called the sarcoplasm. Um, and the membrane of a muscle cell is just called a sarcolemma. And we also have a sarcomy, which is the smallest repetitive contractile unit, um, we'll get, uh, this will make a sense more, this will make more sense later on when we get into um, sort of what a muscle cell looks like at the microscopic level. And um, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of a muscle cell is just called the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it serves a special purpose of storing calcium. Finally, we also have transverse tubules. So um, these are sort of little invaginations of our sarcolemma, which go inside the cell. Okay, so what is a uh, muscle actually made up of? So at the um, large level, we have the muscle, and this is surrounded by connective tissue called epimysium. So as you can see on the diagram, we start off with our tendon, which joins our muscle to bone, and then we have our whole muscle, which is surrounded by this epimysium. And within the muscle, we have muscle fascicles. So these are basically bundles of muscle fiber. And this is surrounded by perimysium, another layer of connective tissue. And within each uh, muscle fascicle, we have individual muscle fibers. And this is surrounded by endomysium. So each muscle fiber is actually a um, muscle cell. So it has a nucleus and our psycho, um, psycholemma, our um, yeah, plasma membrane of our cell. And within each muscle fiber or muscle cell, we have these units that we were talking about earlier, these myofibrils. And within these myofibrils, we then have um, individual microfilaments. Yeah, so what does a microfilament look like? So it's basically made, sorry, what does a myofibril look like? So it's basically made up of microfilaments and they're made up of two proteins. We have myosin and we also have actin. And so um, this is quite high yield and you'll see this image a lot of times in future. So you will get more and more familiar with it. But basically what the microfilament looks like, we have sort of these overlapping uh, lines of myosin and actin. So we'll start off with um, sort of this diagram on the right here. So this Z disc, um, so that is made up of um, actin. And as you can see, lines of actin sort of branch out from that. Um, and we also have our I band. So this region is where we have actin only. Um, when the actin um, and the myosin, so actin is the blue, myosin is the red, when that overlaps, we have our A band. And when it's just myosin only, we have what is called our M line. It's not shown in the diagram, but it's where H zone is labeled. Um, H zone also is just where there's only myosin. Um, so basically, um, how this appears histologically, um, the A band, because we have both myosin and actin overlapping, it's going to appear dark. So um, 
we, as you can see in this uh, histological image here, we sort of see this striation, sort of these lines alternating between like pink and white, pink and white. So the pink or dark bit is where we have our A bands. That's where our myosin and actin overlap. And the I band where it's white, this is where we just have actin only. So you can think of uh, myosin as also the thicker filaments and actin as the thinner ones. Great. Um, so next, moving on to how muscles actually contract. You guys will go over this in um, much more depth in your physiology lectures, I believe. Um, so briefly, what happens? So we have a neuromuscular junction. And so this is where our neuron from our nervous system synapses onto our sarcolemma, so the plasma membrane of our muscle cell. And so as our action potential, um, propagates down our neuron and uh, along our muscle cell. The um, action potential also propagates down the T tubules, which go inside the cell. And so this uh, membrane change, sorry, this change in membrane potential causes our sarcoplasmic reticulum to release that stored calcium. Um, and you'll go into more depth, but basically what this calcium does, it triggers a process called cross-bridge cycling and that's what causes contraction in our muscle cells. So the sliding filament theory, very briefly, um, what happens is that the M line starts to move towards the Z line. So in the diagram over here, we have a relaxed and contracted state. So our M line is basically um, our H zone, sort of in the middle. And then our Z line is sort of uh, uh, the Z disc as labeled in the diagram. So when it's relaxed, these are sort of separated, but during contraction, the two start to move closer together. And um, basically these filaments, our thin actin filaments and thick myosin filaments, they slide past each other. And so as they get closer, we get contraction. So the I band shortens and the A band will stay the same during contraction. Yeah, uh, so going over the different types of muscle tissue. So we have three main ones, and this is um, very high yield. So first of all, we have skeletal muscle, uh, which we saw was um, stride. We'll go into more depth about that later on. We also have smooth muscle. And finally, the third type of muscle is cardiac muscle. And on the right, we also have um, different histological images of skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. Yeah, um, so going over the cell length first, skeletal muscle is the longest and uh, both longer than cardiac and smooth muscle. Um, skeletal muscle is also the largest in diameter. And properties, this is um, very important. So skeletal muscle, it is characterized by multiple peripheral nuclei. So what this means is that a muscle cell actually has um, more than one nuclei. Secondly, it's striated. And once again, that's due to our um, A and I band. So we have um, the darker uh, myosin and actin overlap. And we also have the lighter um, sections of our microfilament, which is just actin. And so that's what causes the striation. And it's also cylindrical in shape. So cardiac muscle, it can have uh, one or multiple central nuclei. And similarly to skeletal muscle, it's also striated. Um, but the main difference here is that cardiac, um, skeletal, cardiac muscle is also branched and it has intercalated discs. So David, if you could go to the image before, I can't figure out how to do this. Um, I might have to do that. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. So as you can see, skeletal and cardiac muscle, they're both um, striated. Skeletal muscle, they're just long tubes. There's not really any branching at all. Whereas cardiac muscle, you can see we have branches coming off and they connect to sort of adjacent um, segments of cardiac muscle. Thanks, David. Great, and then smooth muscle, 
we only have a single central nuclei and spirit muscle, it is characterized by um, an unstriated appearance. We also have the T tubules. Uh, this is less important. So in skeletal muscle, our T tubule is surrounded by our sarcoplasmic reticulum on both sides. In cardiac muscle, uh, the T tubules are only surrounded on one side by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And finally, we have no T tubules in smooth muscle. Great. Right. So where do we find skeletal muscle? Well, basically in all your limbs. So um, the muscles that allow you to walk and run, like uh, your biceps, your triceps, um, which controls your arm, that's all skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle, as the name suggests, that's found in your heart. And smooth muscle, that's found in your internal organs. So for example, your um, intestines, your stomach, that's all smooth muscle. Um, and the connection for skeletal muscle, we have uh, classical bundles and also tendons, which connect muscle to bone. In cardiac muscle, as we touched on before, we have intercalated discs, which join uh, different muscle cells together. And most importantly, we have gap and desmosome junctions. So you'll touch on these later on, but basically these are um, what allow um, electrical signals to spread through cardiac muscle. So that way your heart contracts in unison, which is very important for pumping blood. Finally, smooth muscle um, is connected by connective tissue and also gap and desmosome junctions. So skeletal muscle that's voluntary or in other words, controlled by your um, somatic uh, motor system, your cardiac and smooth muscle is involuntary. Um, in other words, controlled by your autonomic nervous system. Finally, skeletal muscle is very rapid and forceful, whereas cardiac muscle, um, it's lifelong, so it sort of uh, continuously contracts throughout your whole life. Um, and finally, smooth muscle is slow, sustained, and can be rhythmic. Um, so for skeletal muscle specifically, so not smooth or cardiac muscle, we actually have a few types of fibers. We have type 1 called slow twitch, type 2A fast twitch oxidative, and type 2B fast twitch glycolytic. Um, and so these different muscle fibers, they have different characteristics and serve different purposes. Um, so for our type 1 slow twitch fibers, these are the most uh, fatigue resistance. So uh, they're used for long distance running. So even you, even after using them a lot, um, you won't feel very fatigued or sore. How type 2A, um, these fibers are most engaged for about 400 meter and 800 meter sprints and runs. Um, and these are uh, fast switch oxidative. And these are sort of in the middle of the spectrum. So they're um, not as fatigue resistance as type 1, but more fatigue resistance than type 2B. Finally, for type 2B, we engage these fibers during short sprints. So 100 meter sprints, um, when you're running that, uh, think of type 2B fibers. And these have um, very low fatigue resistance, so you get fatigued very easily. Um, uh, so it makes sense that after running a sprint, you're very tired compared to long distance running. Yeah, and this is just a table to summarize that. Um, so the main difference is that um, the composition, so type 1 slow twitch, we have lots of mitochondria, but type 2b has less mitochondria and more glycogen instead. For the properties, um, type 1 slow twitch fibers, they're small fibers, whereas type 2 fibers, they're much larger. And um, yeah, and the rest is just summarized there. And so that's all for muscles today. Um, now I want to go to, uh, we're going to talk about primary healthcare in HKS. So next slide. Right, these are the learning objectives, and we'll go through them as we go through slides. Yep, next slide. All right, primary healthcare. So, explain the concept of primary healthcare. So, what is it? 
It's basically essential healthcare made universally accessible to individuals and families in the, in the community by means acceptable to them through their full participation and at a cost that the community and country can afford. So it's um, a lot of words in there, but you need to kind of tick all those boxes to ensure that you're having a good primary health care. Um, primary health care is also a horizontal program, which means it's a comprehensive approach seeking to treat all the underlying causes or issues of population that cause various diseases and health problems. Whereas um, a vertical program, which isn't the primary health care one, vertical pro uh, program would just be like strictly treating a, a disease, for example. So primary health care kind of involves a lot of different aspects that they need to take into account and they're trying to address the issues that are causing various diseases instead of just treating the diseases. And if we do that in the long term, we could help have communities and countries treating and having a much better health care by themselves without needing the help of other countries that might or organizations that might have more power. Um, so some of the conditions that we kind of recommend to have for an efficient primary health care are listed in that little picture there. One is evidence-based care. You know, we need to make sure that we're using the proper scientific evidence to inform programs and practices, intersexual, and this is just talking about um, other sectors just kind of being all considered and thought about when you're doing and making a good primary health care. Also culturally acceptable because we're going to, you know, basically help with different communities and cultures and countries, it will lead to possibly differences in cultures and we need to make sure we accept the differences and make sure that the primary health care is fitted to the cultures and the individual context that they might be having. Um, also accessible technology, we need to make sure we have good technologies because that's really vital to have good healthcare now. Uh, and also a participatory approach, so making sure that there's a frequent reference to self-determination of communities and individuals. And so we need the communities and commu communities and countries to be doing it themselves more so than someone else kind of doing it for them. Also affordability, we've got to always make sure it's affordable or else really no one could possibly come because it's not affordable. And also first contact with health systems. So we need to make sure that the first contact system is really important because that's what primary care normally refers to, like GP, nurse, things like that. Okay, next slide. Yep, so health indicators. So what are they? Well, it's like a measure deserved, are designed to summarize information about a given priority topic in a population health or health system performance. Um, and it also allows us to compare and also have act actionable information across different demographics, organizations, and administrative boundaries, and can track progress over time. So these are some of them. Just read through them in your own time. Next slide. I believe this is the last slide. And it's talking about community development. So we talked about how primary healthcare, we need to make sure that there's a participatory approach and that everyone is, or well, not everyone, but as in the community and country is doing their best to take over the responsibility of good healthcare instead of an organization or different country helping them all the time. So that would involve um, a lot of different things. And these are some examples. So firstly, um, there's a lot of mosquito borne viruses in low poor resource countries such as Ding fever, I believe that's pronounced. So these are some ways. First is long lasting insectal net. So these, I think, have reduced all cause on the five, so um, age of five child mortality by 20%. So it's been very useful. And that it's recommended that it's free distribution. So we can give it to people who are at risk, who are normally those who are in poverty. Um, also, 150 million ITNs are needed each year to protect 450 million people. So we need a lot of people, a lot of nets. So we need to make sure that those are accessible and affordable. Also, indoor residual spray. These are just basically spraying the indoor surfaces, so killing off the mosquitoes as much as they can, or trying to um, take them away. Um, side effects do exist, such as exposure to insecticides. So that could possibly lead to some harm in their health. And we also need 
a great education for those involved in spraying in householders because these are still chemicals that are designed to kill bugs that definitely could have an impact on you and your family. So we need to make sure for that. And also poverty and waste management. We use car tires and all these different you know, plastic bottles and all this um, waste in poor countries are great for uh, breeding mosquitoes. So we need to make sure that um, these are considered and possibly taken into consideration. Um, also increased urban population growth and increased poverty are also great you know, risk factors. So draining stagnant bodies of water can possibly reduce mosquito growth. So these are just three examples of community development. So trying to make sure that the community and the countries are taking their role in trying to help with um, uh, with um, healthcare in general. Yep, and that's it for today. Thank you so much. I'll just stop recording as soon as I figure out how to do that.